welcome. Episode 36, would you believe, and the official second um, episode for 2021. Basically season two, I reckon they call it, don't they? They call it season two. Would you call that, Oscar? I'm well, Tony Viner. It, He's Oscar. Call it, call it whatever you want, TV. <laughs> um, so what we do, uh, we're here with regard to things property in WA, and um, we encourage you to ask your questions. If you're out there, there's plenty of people out there buying. There's plenty of people out there selling. There's obviously people contemplating buying. There's obviously people contemplating selling. You may be subdividing. We had a great question last week about um, a client, uh, a, 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 not so much a client, but a, um, a person who's identified our show and came and asked us some questions, a really good question actually, about buying some property and then doing some development, subdividing and doing some development. So that that's the sort of thing that we're really keen to do. Um, the purpose of our exercise is trying to discover the answers for you. We're not selling anything. We're uh, it's uh, Property Avenue WA is presented by um, Oscar and I and our respective business being dedicated to property management and uh, champion based settlements. And um, hence we have Property Avenue WA. And we've got some really good stuff to talk about this this week. Um, we particularly want to discuss other than the stats and what's going on in the property market, which is well been well documented here in Perth um, and West Australia as a whole. But also there's been some interesting articles in the papers and on TV about the, all the, the world of property. Um, we also want to discuss, um, I, it was a really interesting article I read about, you know, we talk about investors buying in the current market. Um, there was an article this week about when should you sell your investment property, which I thought was intriguing. Um, there was a reference too about the Midwest region and what's going over the, uh, happening there in, in, in the region. And regions, reading the papers the other day, Oscar, it appears that the regions across the country are uh, all sort of being um, uh, plenty of interest being shown from uh, people looking at buying property. Um, special conditions on contracts, something that we, Oscar and I, have been discussing um, and perhaps always discussing, certainly in my field. So we'll, we'll address a few of those and certainly termite reports, electrical, gas and plumbing, uh, let's not go there, uh, building reports and a few other things. And the other thing with regard to something we thought's important, when you're, there's a lot of people selling and a lot of people buying. And so you sell your property, you intend to buy another. It's important, real important with the special conditions to identify the, the simultaneous settlement, but also link them up. It's really important to link them up because it become a nightmare for the settlement agent and can be a nightmare for you. And what about the landlord who um, decided to pitch a tent and reside in the yard of the property whilst the tenant still had a lease? I thought that was intriguing. Not here in WA, fortunately, but I thought it was worth a chat. And the shed. Is it a men's thing? A shed? Is the shed a men's thing or is that a lady thing? I mean, every house has got one. I'm, I, I'd be surprised if you haven't. But um, we're going to talk about the good old shed. And uh, I thought we would finish off, amongst other things, I thought we'd have a NIF question, which... I reckon it might be focused around a shed. So, uh, OD, welcome, mate. How was your week? Mate, uh, really good. Good. Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, uh, what episode? Episode 36, did you say? 36. So, yep. Season 2, episode 36. And, uh, you know, as I quickly look across my calendar, we're almost halfway through January. So... Here we go with just another one of those really, really fast years. But um, look, just another, it's been a big week for me, uh, another big week in real estate as well. It's going to be interesting, though, because um, I've, I've obviously done a bit of a stat analysis just uh, just from the REWA statistics and, and also from uh, CoreLogic and realestate.com just to have a look at what these different um, uh, knowledgeable uh, and reputable real estate websites are saying in terms of what are the, what are the stats of what's just happened and where do they think things are going? And um, I'm not. It's hard to tell. I mean, I, I personally think we might be at a little bit of a turning point, maybe even a bit of a levelling off. Um, oh, Tony Viner, mate, I've, I've, we've somehow lost you again. I don't know where you've disappeared, but I'm just going to pretend that you'll be coming back shortly. Um, but yeah, there might be a little bit of a levelling off in the market. My disclaimer for that, though, is that we're just right in this Christmas period, like over the last few weeks, and that's typically when there's lots of people on holidays, um, that might be individuals, that might be... Oh, you're back, are you? Thank, thanks for coming. I've got a, little, got a few little connection issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that seems to be a bit of a problem for you uh, in life in general, isn't it? That whole, whole connecting thing, but... Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so the, my disclaimer is the data that I've got at my fingertips 
it, it could be a bit distorted just because they you typically anywhere. expect there to be a slowdown in activity um, in transactions anyway over that Christmas and New Year period. And I think the, uh, the sales activity certainly shows that. In fact, the rental activity shows that as well, that there's been a slowdown in transactions. Um, but what does that mean for January and, and I guess the first quarter of, uh, of 2021? In particular, uh, the sales volumes just in the last seven days up until the 10th of January was only 699 sales. Now, we haven't had that lower sale volume for easily 12 months um, because, as you know, we've had a very buoyant market over the period of uh, 2019 um, and obviously into 2020. So, um, yeah, it's a... It's, a, a low number in terms of 699 sales, but probably the most interesting um, uh, statistic so far as the sales market is concerned is that our listings um, supply has dropped down to just over 8,200 listings. Now, this is the first time in I don't know how many years, but I'd speculate it could be as much as five years that we've dropped to anywhere near that level um, in terms of uh, 8,000 listings. Um, it wasn't long ago that we were at 14 and 15,000 listings um, and we saw a major, major shift um, and drop in listings over the course of 2020. Um, but for a long time there, that actually stayed between that nine and 10,000 properties um, and close to 10,000 in terms of available properties in Perth for sale, but now that's actually dropped down to uh, just over 8,200. So whilst the volume of transactions has dropped, the real estate agents are reporting amazing numbers through the home opens, and every single real estate agent that I talk to is talking about the fact that they just have not got enough listings. Um, and I think that's also supported by the low number of listings available um, in Perth currently. So. The rental market, again, is a bit of a different story. Uh, 702 properties leased in the last uh, seven days. 12 months ago, in the same week, it was over a 1,000 properties. Um, and so 702 is a bit on the low side, but that vacancy rate of just under 1% remains very stable at, uh, so it's about 2,800 properties available through suburban Perth, and that seems to be stabilized it seems to be quite stable um and and as does that vacancy rate it's still a super super tight vacancy rate at just under one percent obviously but it hasn't seemed to move to 0.6 or 0.5 percent and the the availability hasn't dropped further so i'm not sure there might be a bit of a taping off um or a stabilization of the rental market but so far as the sales market and that very very low volume of stock um, yeah, I don't think that uh, we've seen that level any time in the last five years. So it's going to continue to be a very strong market for WA property. There's no doubt. Is that, um, you talk about January, but I mean, it was interesting to note that like December is normally a quieter month, but yet from all reports and some of the articles we read, um, that's quite the opposite. Um, and then you get January where people on holidays so we are entering a, a different phase, aren't we? I mean, and that's really obvious with regard yeah. to what's going on. Yeah, no question. Um, you know, the amount of people and, and just talking to the, the number of different selling agents that I do, um, which, uh, which is a, a decent handful each week. Um, yeah, uh, there's been no quiet period whatsoever. Uh, they would have liked to have had a little bit of time off, but ultimately with the, the stock that they've got, the listings that they've got, They've got that much buyer inquiry. They've got that many people after it. Um, and also those people that would normally go away, overseas holidays, eastern states, wherever it is, we know that they've been restricted pretty much to WA uh, and certainly stayed within the country. Um, and because they don't want to, they don't want the market to run away with them, uh, sorry, it will run away from them, they've got the time to actually make sure they can purchase that next property. So the whole quiet period of December, January just has not happened at all this year. Not at all. Yep. Yep. And and it's interesting too that, um, uh, you know, that there was another article uh, during the week where it referred to the fact that um, they felt that the East Coast investors were pushing the prices up here in, 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 um, in WA and particularly in Perth. And so that's got to have an influence because people here in WA, I know I've got clients who have contacted me who are concerned because 
they're trying to get there before the price does get too high and become suddenly, un, you know, they should have ended up getting the peak of the market. Although I think that's going to be a way off too because the way things appear to be going, um, this is not just a, um, a five-minute wonder. And and interesting to note too, I know we're, you know, probably having a WA, the focus is about WA, but I've sort of been observing various articles right across around the country and even now, there was an article, dare I say it, but even with regard to the, the property market in the United States, it's really intriguing as to what this COVID, you know, all this negativity when COVID first came about. And yet, in, as far as property is concerned around Australia, and more so the East Coast where they've had, you know, lockdowns and still got issues, et cetera, it's really interesting to see what's going on. We obviously were the first to start, and we've been predicted as being, the, the movers and groovers for, for 2021. And yet, when you look at the different articles across the board, it's just very interesting to have to see what's going on around the country. Yeah. Yeah, look, that's right. Matt, I haven't kept uh, in, in touch or have no knowledge of what's going on internationally in terms of uh, in terms of real estate. But getting back to, to Australia, and or rather in particular WA, uh, we've yep. spoken quite a bit over the last few weeks about the C word, the new C word for 2021. And we know that obviously the C word for 2020 was COVID uh, and that hasn't really gone away yet. But then the new C word that I've spoken about a few times is obviously China, the trade relations with China. And we've seen just in the last three months um, the, uh, the diminishing of that uh, relationship that we've got. Um, and that's actually Im started to impact on our on our local industries, um, whether it be the fishing industry, obviously, you know, the mining industry, uh, the farming, the cattle industry as well. Um, I think it, it goes on, the wine industry as well, it, it goes on. That said, when you look at how strong our economy is, our WA economy, so far as mining and iron, iron ore is concerned, and you look at the record prices that iron ore are currently achieving, 160, 170 bucks. I know. Time. It was not long ago, mate, that it was 65 and 70 bucks a ton. And I remember yep. when it dropped down to 45 as well. And that was not a long time ago. So the boom that we're going through at the moment is, um, I don't know, I, I uh, no, you know, who can predict what's about to happen? Um, because every single thing and, and the cheap price of money, the interest rates, yep. every single thing pre predicts a really, really sizable boom you know over the over the next you know few years at least uh but then there's that covid factor and we really don't know uh how much of a lengthy impact that's going to ha have on the world because in the uk um they've got a long long way to recover out of the thick of it with what they're currently in so we're we're, we're a lucky yeah well to be, uh, oh big time i've got a as i say, i think i've told you before i've got a son um, who lives in and works in uh, the UK, in London there. He's in the heart of London. And, and um, you know, normally he would catch a plane like we catch taxis in relation to his work because he, he does international law. And um, he's worked from home since March. He's been basically in lockdown since March. Um, we've obviously contacted him and making sure he's okay. And he assures us he is. And as he points out, I'm happy with my own space, Dad. Um, but, you know, there's only so long where you're living on your own and uh, you're working, but that seems to be the way of the world, and certainly the UK, when you compare what they are doing and what's happening there um, and what we're doing here, um, there's still, we can't take it easy, but it is interesting as to what's going on, and certainly um, you talk about the mining industry and you talk about our, our property industry, but I think as we stated, might have been last episode or the one before Christmas, where the, the, the number of... Um, projects that are underway or already been approved and to go with mining um that would suggest and uh these guys have probably got their finger on the pulse the people around all that have probably got their finger on the pulse better than you and i but that would suggest that that's giving you know plenty to uh, plenty of impetus with regard to the wa economy for a while yet by the sounds of it yeah look and i mean you mentioned uh well uh you, I think you're talking about the Midwest, or I think, and we'll talk about the the Midwest in terms of 
Geraldton and the, the surrounding Midwest um, <clears throat> regions and the population yep. over there and the statistics we've seen about uh, the median price growth just in the last 12 months, which blew me out of the water when I actually saw what the statistics suggested. Uh, the yep. Northwest, obviously, so far as um, the greater mining picture is concerned. But the other thing that I mentioned just before as well, when I was talking about COVID and we don't know what COVID's going to do, I really did say that in a bit of a, uh, an almost a, a um, cynical uh, or a conservative kind of matter. But when we look at what COVID's actually done to our real estate market, when it didn't stop the market or it didn't stop the economy dead in its tracks, what it's actually done is further fueled a burning fire so far as demand for property is concerned, because we've seen it not just down south, because it's happened up north, but largely down south in the uh, the Dunsborough, the Bustleton, the Margaret River region, um, even so far as Albany or Augusta, people have been moving away from the city be it to work for that better uh, work life and lifestyle balance because COVID taught us how to do that. Um, yep. And it forced yeah. it upon us for, for almost a couple of months um, and, you know, we went, oh, gee, hang on, if we can actually do this, why don't we do more of it? And that, in by and large, has had a major impact on what's happened in that real estate market down in the southwest. So, yep. And, yep. and that's a positive, you know, it's, it's not really a negative. It's, it's not the market's gone backwards because of COVID. If anything, that's pushed the market further forwards. So COVID's also got, you know, it has got some positive spin-off. Yep. And... And which gets to the point of um, an article on in Saturday's paper in the real estate section about the Midwest region on the rise, which I found really, I don't deny that it's um, there's been on the rise and certainly for lots of reasons. And I think its diversification is really interesting as far as um, the Midwest concerned, because it's as far as a regional economy is concerned, it's so diverse with what it has to offer. Um, but what I found really interesting, the median house price growth in 2020 had increased by 22.3%, which I was sort of quite taken aback by because I thought, wow, that's um, that, that's that's really interesting. And and when I look at that further, they actually say that that um, the, the suburb of Jordan, that is, right, the suburb of Jordan, so that's the inner city part, um, has been identified with a growth of 23%. But the the, um, the West End, so that's down near the wharf and around the Fisherman's Wharf and the beachfront there, all in there. Um, that's had an increase, um, which um, anything up to 20, um, 27.7%, 22.9% and 23.6%. So that includes West End, Utica and Wagrakine. So Wagrakine really? is sort of about the... Northern, yeah, northern parts, um, the northeastern parts, I suppose. I was going to ask you about, t tell me about a couple of the outer fringe Geraldton suburbs because I'd be interested to know what, what sort of growth rates they've suggested for that. And the reason yep. being is, as we know, with any, with any uh, settlement, uh, or particularly with Geraldton, the further you go <clears throat> away from the coast, the further you go um, away from the, the central uh, city centre area, um, the more land supply there is and ultimately the cheaper the land will be. And that goes for Geraldton, that goes for any township, and it certainly goes for Perth as well. Um, and from my point of view, with my experience with Geraldton, one of the biggest growth dampeners that it's got in terms of really sending Geraldton forward is the fact that it's got such a large future land supply. So there's a lot of land now, but there's a lot of future land supply of land zoned and ready to go for residential development when the demand is there. So um, I'm probably even more surprised to hear that the outer areas such as Utakara, Wagrakine, don't know about Bondina, uh, Glenfield, those sorts of fringe areas, if they've experienced yep. the same level of growth. But um, ultimately, any growth is good growth, and um, the people of Geraldton. Well, this is what this is what it. will it really this is what really intrigue you. Mullawar saw a thirty percent spike. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I can I because Mullawar doesn't have a huge land supply and. As we all know, in real estate, the only thing that ever goes up in value is the land. The, the, everything above the land, which is typically the house, 
or, or the shed, as you'll refer to later. But anything above the land typically uh, depreciates and that bit of it goes down in value. But the thing that goes up in value is the value of the land. So it, whenever you're looking at price growth, you've got to remember that, well, where is land scarcest? And the scarcity of land is typically closer to the city centre and closer to the coast. Um, and when it comes time to Mullawar, well, Mullawar's got a uh, only a very uh, limited housing supply anyway. So just like they can have a 20 or 30% increase because, you know, they might have doubled the sales volumes over 12 months, um, it can be highly volatile as well. And you can see that 30% not be there the following year. So, but that said, on the face of it, it's a good thing for Mullawar. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but it's also interesting interesting with regard to the Midwest region and the Geraldton area because the other thing that was very, um, uh, you, you might mention about the 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 future um, land supply, but it's also got one thing that I took notice of, which um, I made reference to Tim Glenister, who's the chair chairman of the uh, Midwest Development Commission. And um, as he pointed out that in this article, you know, you've got a very, you've got a booming aqua, uh, aquaculture industry as well and so you not only got a um uh, it's, as we said before a diverse region but you and and strong mining but then you've got an aquaculture industry so all of a sudden that's attracting people because of employment etc and so some of these other areas outer areas they suit people's lifestyle that's the other thing isn't it and it's still and it's yeah. affordable hey tv just on that have you got any um have you got any fishing clients up there in Geraldton that can give you a bit of a summary as to you know what the what the, the changes in the cray fishing industry largely to do with the China not uh, taking the usual yep. intake that they would? Um, yep. So what's been the what's been the roundup of that uh, now that the Christmas period's finished? Yep, I will. Um, I I'm at factly um, planning to head up there hopefully Thursday. And um, and I'll be up there for a little bit because I've got a bit to do, clients to see and people to see and my dear mum. So while I'm there, um, not only will I try and play a game of golf, but I'll try and uh, touch base with a couple of guys and see if we can't get some info. Um, yeah, good. With regard to that. Yeah. Yeah, good. I've, good, good. I've just written myself a little note regarding that. But, yeah, so it's really interesting. And I think the other part, being a Geraldton boy myself and being brought up there, one thing that hasn't changed with Geraldton, it's got magnificent beaches, um, I personally think it's a great place to bring up kids, and you've you've had your uh, you've you've had the experience there, living there for a period, um, and and it's got a really strong and healthy sporting culture. You know, there's been some exceptionally good sportsmen produced from a lot of country areas in WA, but um, Geraldton has been pretty good. Certainly produced uh, some pretty handy footballers, both at waffle level and AFL level. It's certainly produced uh, some champion hockey players um that that not only represented the state but represented australia um there's netballers so um you know a, across the board and it's been for a long time i mean we've had um really strong i say we being a Jordan person but you know um we've had even had um, badminton players represent australia so it's got a lot to offer both not only just in in facilities but um lifestyle climate you know, and so I can understand why there's a fair bit of interest being shown, and it's affordable. So it's really interesting, yeah. and it was, it's one of those articles that I reckon um, they could have expanded on that a bit more personally, because I reckon it's uh, it was an interesting little point. I'm not. I'm sure it's not the last time that you'll, uh, you know, that that sort of an article will be written about the Midwest region, uh, or in fact, all all the regions of WA. I think that this next twelve months they'll get uh, a great deal of press, um, and largely for the reasons that you said. I did have a number of years up in Geraldton, and I think, like anything, you realise how good something is possibly when when you don't have it anymore so i certainly yep. miss the the time and um the time that i had up there uh i'm not dissatisfied with where i am now obviously back in perth but um yeah no Geraldton will always be a a very close place for me and um i wouldn't discount ever not being back there you know it's um it's great for all the reasons that you mentioned um we we're probably going to touch on it a little bit later mate but because we're talking so much about Geraldton and the uh the sporting um a talent that it's been able to develop and produce. What about breakdancing? <laughs> well, you tell me about sure. the breakdancing in Did Europe. you see that? I, I just think that's a classic. The new Olympic sport, I, I, I think the only thing that 
um, might be a problem is whether the the Olympics that are due to happen in Japan this year, um, they were due last year, and they've been extended out of this year, but breakdancing has been introduced as a new Olympic sport. I mean, I know that's probably old news to some people, but I just tickle my fancy. I meant to raise it before Christmas, and I thought, this, Oscar, if this is not an opportunity for you to represent Australia, this has got your name all over it. <laughs> but that's not a joke, though, is it? Like, it's really it's going true. to be, it, it is really a, a is that an approved, approved, it's approved Olympic sport now? It is, pardon? It's an They're approved Olympic to, sport? Yeah, and the purpose of the exercise is to try to sort of do something for the young people. Now, surely I would have thought running and jumping and playing other sports was exactly for young people, but that's what apparently what the story is, so breakdancing. Although the latest news, the latest news um, with regard to Japan, I know my brother uh, who lives in Singapore and he's he coaches, uh, he's the national hockey coach over there, and they're due for a tournament in Japan, and... Um, uh, at this point in time, he can't see that happening. So they're, they're all training their little butts off, hoping to uh, get a game happening somewhere. And um, there's been further news about uh, COVID. And this is the thing, yeah. isn't it? Like everything, it's just you just don't know from one day to the next, let alone a month in time. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so break dancing may be on hold for a little bit for the Olympic Games, but um, it's on the agenda. It's on Tell the you, go. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to touch on something that we did talk about a little bit um Sure. Um, but prior to us starting tonight, um, and it is it's something that is really really important uh, so far as uh, real estate is concerned. It sometimes involves tenants, but it mostly involves sellers and buyers of property, which is almost everyone um, and probably anyone that's um, that's watching the show as well. And that is to do with the way that uh, the contract clauses are structured. Um, and I thought. If you want to give a, a bit of an overview as to the different sorts of clauses that that are not standard clauses, but very important clauses so far as the contract's concerned, bearing in mind that we are not providing legal advice here or anything like that. It's more so bringing people's awareness to the fact that there are these clauses on these contracts. And in particular, there's a certain way that they need to be written um, if they're actually going to uh, serve the intended purpose, because often you'll see a contract uh, or rather a clause, and it's got one quarter of the information in there, as in the what, what is this clause about, but it doesn't talk about who, how much, when, uh, and what if it doesn't happen. So I want to quickly, I kind of just did touch on the structure of it, but uh, maybe you can uh, have a quick chat about the sorts of clauses that you'll often see, um, and then we can talk about a structure. Yeah, look, yeah. Um it is something that I have emphasised for so damn long, and in fact, it's part of what I do separate to our settlement agency. Obviously, as a settlement agent, it's something we address all the time. But I have, as you know, um, a consulting business and do that. And in fact, we had a lovely young friend of mine, uh, client of mine, where only this week, where an issue arose, where uh, it was somewhat frustrating as to um, the contract, um, and. Probably the main three, but certainly in WA, is a termite report. It's just a must. But that termite, just having a termite report is not just enough. And you've got to ensure that the timeframes, I think, are really important within the termite report. And then if there is termites or damage located, then identifying a solution and the time frame for that solution to be addressed. And when I say solution, if there's going to be a remedy or there's going to be treatment, whatever the case may be, then that needs to be included. So... Termite report, particularly in WA, is of utmost importance. The other item that I would – so I consider these the top three. The other one is the electrical, plumbing and gas. And when I refer to that, that's to, that's ensuring that those things, particularly when you do a pre-settlement inspection, are all in working order and all going okay and doing the things they're meant to do. And so we refer to the fact that the lights are working and we refer to the fact that the toilets are flushing and things of that nature. And, again, it needs to be – um, you know, you touch on about conditions and clauses in contracts. The, the importance of all these clauses is being specific, really, really got to be specific. And not only do we need to identify a clause, but we need to identify a, a lot. The other thing that's interesting when I talk about this, when we talk about special conditions, sometimes people refer to it as, refer to it as a warranty, and it, quite often you'll see agents refer to a clause 
as being they warrant such and such. And I'll get a lawyer to discuss this because a warranty and giving a warrant for something to be in order, working order at settlement and a condition are two distinctly different things. And we had a situation recently with a, with a, um, with a contract for settlement where there was a warranty involved. And as we said, there's no restriction for the seller or the buyer to hold up settlement. It's a warranty. And so as long as the seller agrees to get that fixed, um, it doesn't hold up settlement. But what we'll do is we'll get a lawyer associated with that because a lot of contracts I'm seeing at the moment where real estate firms and real estate representatives are referring to the condition as a warranty. And there's a major, major difference and it can be it can have a significant impact on on the settlement process it can have a significant impact impact on the buyer and the seller so that's a really important factor the other item that i would refer to as a probably one of the big three is a building inspection report and that causes a lot of grief for people um when i say a lot of grief not as far as the report because it, but what that report identifies and the report more often than not is a structure report but what more often the building report will identify is they'll identify that and then sort of say yes it's structurally sound but it'll identify a whole range of maintenance issues now if there's no condition in there to cover those maintenance issues then and the buyer goes hang on i've got all these things well it's not in the contract your report was a building report structure report and if that report by the builder identifies the property being structurally sound all those maintenance issues if they're not in the contract in any way, shape or form or any reference to them, they don't apply. So those are the three that I would consider and getting back to what you're saying is um, of being specific. Yeah. Um, just in terms of that last one that you just mentioned, TV, uh, I've seen quite a bit of um, <clears throat> communication amongst real estate agents and on Facebook chats and everything just, just over the last week about uh, building reports and it causing grief on contracts. And I think it's for that exact reason that you just said. Builders uh, or, or the inspectors will go out and do what they need to so far as the structural uh, side is concerned. But I, I, I guess it must be part of their scope that even general maintenance items they need to report on. Um, yep. And that is causing grief for the real estate agents, for the buyers and the sellers and, and therefore the settlement agents as well, because it is a building structural report um, and it doesn't typically refer to um, an action plan for any maintenance items. Because unless you're buying a brand new house, um, you should be expecting maintenance items in the house. That's just what happens to old houses. And whenever it is that you build a new house, typically there will be a six-month maintenance uh, inspection done by the builder, but that forms part of your building contract at the time that you build the house. But further down the track, that's not really an option. So um, it does, it is has been causing a bit of grief. Um, and most real estate agents these, these days, so far as these typical clauses, I won't call them standard, but they are typical clauses that you'll see on a contract that are in addition to the standard contract. Um, they're normally drafted up um, in some legal form, whether it be by the Real Estate Institute uh, of WA's lawyers or agencies will have their own lawyers draw up those conditions to make sure that they're written correctly and they satisfy that they have a structure to them. Now, the structure that I'm referring to is basically four parts to it. The first thing is what. So what are we talking about? Um, and if we want a building structural report, we've got to make sure that the first bit of the clause says that um, the seller agrees to the buyer undertaking a building structural report. That's the first bit. The second bit is who. Who's going to pay for the report? Who's going to organise the report as well? Because if we just say the um, uh, seller is aware that the buyer intends to do one, well, do, is the buyer intending that the seller is going to pay for it? Or is the does the seller need to go and organise it themselves and supply it to the buyer? So in terms of the who, we've got to be very, very specific there uh, and not just who in terms of who organises it, uh, but who's going to pay for it as well. Um, when? When does it have to be done? When does it have to be done by? Um, and that bit's that bit is normally addressed pretty well in a condition, but sometimes it's not, uh, and that can actually jeopardise the uh, the validity of a contract if it's not done in time. And the the final bit, and probably each bit of the the clause is is um, is important, but this this bit's super important. What if? 
the what if is if this doesn't happen, if the what doesn't happen, if there is a structural report, um, but for some reason it runs late or it doesn't happen or it turns up a great deal of structural hours, uh, uh, structural problems, um, the, the what if bit is a very, very important bit of the structure of the clause because that gives all parties direction as to where do we go from here? Because otherwise yep. it's left up to interpretation. And with the number of contacts that we've all seen, a seller is going to interpret it favourable to the seller uh, and the buyer is obviously going to interpret it favourable to the buyer and the settlement agent and the bank and the real estate agent just get caught in the middle. So it's so much easier to have it properly structured from the start with a what, a who, a when and a what if. And it's really, really important to make sure that's done, not just from a real estate agent's point of view, but for anyone who's buying or selling properties read over your contracts um, and preferably before you sign them to make sure that those contracts are structured so that it's not going to cause you problems a few weeks down the track. Yeah, and it's one of my, uh, as, as my staff and a lot of my clients will tell you, one of my big, big, big um, references when I'm talking to people, putting contracts together or ask me questions, cater for the what if. It's just really, really important. And that in itself is just really important with regard to identifying and including special condition on the contract, the what if. And, um, yeah, couldn't agree more with what you're saying. And, and um, uh, look, some of, the, some of the clauses we see and some of the uh, special conditions that are put on contracts, I, I do question who, is, who has structured those because the content and some of that um, is just... <clears throat> um does our head in and cause a lot of grief and um certainly i'm not a big uh one with the social the, the settlement agent social media but i certainly know people bring it to my attention that some of the commentary that goes on within the um the conveyancing industry um and their grief about special conditions it causes a lot of a lot of pressure a lot of angst um with regard to trying to get a settlement to where it's meant to be, um, purely simply because the special conditions are the, th are the things that cause so much, as I say, so much angst. It causes delays um, and it costs money. And there's costs involved where yeah, things right. aren't done right. The other thing being as well is that when they're structured well, when, they, when they're structured correctly, it makes life so, so much easier because oh. there, there's no ang ambiguity, there's no opinion. We just refer back to the contract, back to the black and white, and there's a there's a map of a plan of exactly what needs to happen if A, B or C happens. So, um, and, and real estate agents often, or, or real estate agent officers often do get it right. They absolutely do. Uh, we, I guess we're just referring to the times when it's not got right. Um, it's so much better to spend the time structuring, structuring it right uh, for an extra 10 minutes to put the, con the, the clause together correctly than trying to deal with the problems later on because the problems later on cost you a lot more than 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. and the, other, the other thing, dude, too, with all due respect, is that, you know, you've got people under pressure. It's busy. Everyone's trying to rush. Everyone's trying to rush it through. And everyone's trying to look, we get, I don't want to miss out. Oh, no, that will be okay. And all of a sudden, bang, you know. So there's a whole range of reasons, and let's be let's be also be fair that um, sadly not everybody in our respective industries, um, are, 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 if they're going to if they can take a shortcut they will. If they can be lazy they will. I mean it's in every industry, so don't kid yourself. Um, mm. And so those sort of things are really important that you as the buyer or you as the seller, you as the client, you know, you demand that to be done. If you've got someone there that you're not happy with with regard to saying, look, it'll be right, mate. We'll fix that later on. No, this is what I want. It's got to be in writing. And you demand yeah. that. That's you, you, That's your prerogative. You're the one who's outlaying the money. You're the one, be it the seller or the buyer, who um, the onus is on you. No one's going to come along and say, here, mate, we'll cover that cost. I mean, sometimes it, it might happen, but um, there could be a little bit going on before. So, it's right. There's a lot of agents that do it right and there's a lot of people that do it right. But there's also, sadly, you've got to be aware of the, the people that don't. And you as the buyer or you as the seller need to be conscious of that. And if you're not comfortable with that, then you can go to someone who's independent and say, look, can you have a look at this for me, to, for me? which is what I, a lot of clients I have that do that. I do that for them. We review all that before they sign the dotted line. So, right, yeah. that's, that's it. just an independent, someone independent, not trying to tell everyone how to suck eggs, but just an independent observer. 
Yeah, and it's uh, so we're not trying to educate anyone in the real estate industry here. That, that's not the purpose of it at all. No. The purpose no. is to make sellers and buyers aware that hey, exactly. this stuff needs to be in there. So at the very least, ask the question of your real estate agent um, yep. if uh, yep. if you're in any way uncertain about. Uh, yeah, the what if. What if it, yep. and it only matters when it matters, and most of the time it doesn't, but every time that it does is the time that your clause falls short of what it needed to say. Um, so just don't just don't go down that road. Yep, and uh, yeah, we, we've had that experience this week. Hey, um, uh, the other thing that I found really interesting, we're talking about people and special conditions, is when people are selling and buying property. So you're selling a property, and I've just had that experience with my son um, where he was selling a property and buying another, and there's a lot of that going on at the present as well. Really, really important with your conditions, and it gets back to with what Oscar's just been saying when he we, we go back to, um, to to what. So what is going on here? Yes, I'm selling this property, and 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 the, the intention is with that sale of that property, I'm buying another. What is it that you're buying? Where's that contract? And then we learn to link that contract up. Well, we're going to link the two contracts up. So the one you're buying is subject to the successful sale and settlement of the one you're selling. And that is of utmost importance. And it is to then identify that they are to settle simultaneously. That will limit you if there's any delays. And in fact, we had one recently where there was something like five different settlements all linked up. So wow. there's buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers. Oh, we've had as many as nine nine properties wow. um all linked up buyers and sellers all linked up um and and so that process is really important that if mm. you haven't got those contracts properly linked and properly connected um and being specific as to what you know when settlement's got to occur what if then the what if is what if my uh sale is held up because of my buyer then my purchase is going to be paid. You need to ensure that that's protected in that contract. So yeah. there's all those things there that need to be identified. And that, again, that is a really important part to be aware of. Your real estate agent will help you with that. But certainly, certainly you need to be conscious of it and you need to be aware of it. And don't take shortcuts and don't say, as we've had, oh, it'll be okay. Mine's all covered. Mine's unconditional. It's not a case of whether it's unconditional or not. It's more a case of there's so many parties involved in the process of a settlement, be it the bank, be it a delay for whatever reason. There's a whole range of reasons that can things can hold up, can be held up, and all of a sudden that could impact on you when you've got everybody waiting with removalists trying to shift, and you can't just do that in the spur of a moment. So it's really important. Spot on, mate. What's next on your agenda? Hey, the other thing that I like, I know we were going to mention, but I'll, I think we'll do that next time. It, we'll raise that next week is the is the situation about um, when you've got a rental property and you're selling it. But I'd like to do that as a topic. We've got a bit more time. Yeah. Um, so we'll yeah. do that. We'll definitely do that one next week. But the one I want to talk about, the good old shed. Like, <laughs> seriously, everybody's got a shed, all right? It, there couldn't be a property. There was some form of shed. But um, is it a man thing? Uh, I think it's a it's predominantly a man thing. I'm sure there's some women that love some women that love sheds and and uh, yeah, but I, I <laughs> could run myself into a bit of strife here. But um, yeah, I think predominantly it's a man thing. Hey, speaking of sheds and big sheds, I went for a drive out, out with my family just for a drive something to do uh, on the weekend, I think it was, and we went down to the um, Australian uh, Marine uh, Australian Marine Complex down yep. in uh, down in um, Henderson. There's some yep. pretty big yep. sheds out there, mate. There are some absolute monsters, bigger than I've ever, ever seen in my life, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to work on all those big, massive boats when they're out of the water, like, and to build the boats as well. So there's some big sheds there. Oh, mate, and the other thing being is I wonder whether the shed, I know the sheds are worldwide, but but is the shed, I mean, the shed that I sort of identify, I remember my dear old Pop. Um, we had a big quarter-acre blo block in Geraldton when we were kids. I, we had a hockey field, we had a cricket field, we had a basketball court, and up the very back where there were two sheds, and one shed my Pop built, 
and they had a big they had a tin roof didn't have doors on it and he used to this is where they would have a lie he used to we used to go up there and he had his own razor and his leather strap thing and he'd cut his hair and then he'd cut our hair when we were kids up on the shed <laughs> and that was his domain he used to have the the old radio on um and he would listen to abc as he did and listen to his sport He'd be up near the wood heap, and then of course there was the woodshed because we had a copper for the for mum's washing, the wood wood copper, and we had a wood stove to cook on. So you had a woodshed alongside pop shed, uh, as we call it, and uh, the things that used to happen in that shed, mate, that was like the domain. So the variety of sheds now, some of them you get now. I was looking, and I thought um, how it came about is that of course yeah, how did that happen? Well, how it came about is that I, it was just um, I've got a couple of sheds in my house, right? I will admit I've got one for all my garden tools and we've got one for all our outdoor gear. And the modern world allows you to do stuff and I've got a shed for all my fitness stuff. But I then was um, came across an article about the men's shed and the men's shed is is very much a thing that's now become most communities have got the men's shed. And um, it's a place where the men gather and they get together and they do really good stuff. And it's a, there's now the WA Men's Association, but yeah. it's also a benefit to men's health. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, mental health. Yep, yep, yep. You're referring um, to so men's it's a uh, yes. So it's an area that um, and we when I was on the associate with the uh, Midwest Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, on the board there, we um, we had a bit to do with the men's shed in Geraldton, and uh, it was fabulous to see these guys and some of the stuff that they do, and that's that's their place that they go and they use do, you know, have access to do things. But it's also don't forget, men aren't good at communicating with each other, you know, and um, sometimes the pub's not everybody's cup of tea, and so the men's shed has become a big thing. It's, uh, and now one step further, there is. Um, um, uh, there's now an iPod. There's a lady on ABC, uh, an iPod, a podcast, <laughs> and she does um, a thing about sheds. Yeah, right. And it's a hey, really um, good listen. It's mate, really, so you're, really you're good. Very so tell me. You're very passionate about oh, this, and uh, hey. and I, I clearly am not. Um, but so here's a, little, <laughs> mate, here's a little bit of a, an assignment for you if um, if you choose to accept. But, uh, yeah, if we're going to talk a bit more about sheds, because I'd love to learn a bit more, um, what about if you do a little bit of research as to the shed situation outside of Australia? So why don't you work out what they do with sheds in Indonesia, what they do with sheds in New Zealand, and, you know, the shed culture, yep. uh, the international yep. shed culture. Okay, done, done. And not only that, remember, you'll see on our on our um, Facebook page, and I'll post a few photos after the show, but you'll also see one of the more famous sheds has got to be the shearing shed, right, the wool shed. And I remember as kids going out to um, the amount of time that we spent on my cousin's farm in the shearing shed, the fun we used to have there getting under the, the sheep poo, under the, under the sheep shed and there in amongst the wool and rati ra and pretending we're shearing sheep, whatever. Um, and of course, the other famous shed that here in WA is the blue shed there at Crawley on the on the on the the foreshore there. Yeah. Um, famous famous shed. So yeah. Um, sheds oh, I are. Little, I'm, sheds I'm, I know a little bit of background and history and the owner and all that of that um, that shed, which back when I first came across it and found out about it, and I, I met the guy and the family that owned it. Uh, to me, it was like, well, to me, it was a couple of things. It was, oh, yeah, I, I knew where it was because I, I know it's around the corner from UWA and everything, but I didn't really know much about the history of it. And also at the time, it was a pretty old rundown thing that was just sitting there and it didn't look as good and as iconic as what it does today and, and in that photo. So that's yep. it when it, yeah. since it's been refurbed or whatever, but uh, it, it hasn't always looked like that. But um, I think that's one of the most um, photographed, uh, tourist attractions um, oh. in in WA, huge, 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 and so you know the shed is there's the garden shed, but of course there's also ladies who use that I've had a look too, so I'm going to do this thing because it's really got me intrigued because it is property related, but there's called the she shed, the what the the, the she shed, 
The she shed. The she shed. So I'm going to check all this out. I've got it's got me excited. I felt I was doing something this afternoon and I started doing a bit, and then all of a sudden I'm like, "Wait, this is this is a topic in itself." The shed, and I yeah. reckon we can get people involved. I'm going to make a big deal of it. Yeah, well, mate, I, I do know that you've had a bit of time on your hands recently and you've been trying to work out oh. what to do with yourself. And so, uh, yeah, new passion. Oh, uh, well, I'll tell you a story, and this is true. So we've got a client of ours. No, 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 this is true. This is property related. So this lady, uh, she is now on her own, and she decided she'd buy herself. This is true. This is an actual fact in here in WA. So she's bought herself, got herself a nice uh, four-wheel drive and got herself a nice caravan. And um, she wants to trip around, and obviously with what with COVID, that's going to be um, fairly restrictive, and she's certainly not going to be going overseas. So she wanted to ch check out Australia and WA. One one the, the other issue then is that she sold her house. Then she what she decided she's going to build something. So then she decided she'd build a shed, which would be because she's not going to be there all the time. So what she did, she built this shed. That shed had a bedroom on one side and a bathroom, and then something else to the other. And what she did, because she had difficulties reversing, she built this house in a way which is currently, I don't know whether it's been completed, but I'll have to catch up with her um, when it is, and I'm going to get photos of it. And I'm sure she won't mind me. Um, I'll check with her first. But she has now built it. So the shed, the house has got, or the shed has got living and whatever on one side and um, entertainment on the other, um, storage on the other, and she drives her caravan through the middle of the shed, the house, right? <laughs> so she doesn't have to reverse, and she parks and locks up both ends. That's now awesome. that is a that shed. Is, hey? mate, that is um, in my uh, that that is that's a fantastic shed, mate. And I'm going to get a photo. I'll tell you about that later. Yep. And good honour. I've seen just very quickly. I've seen um, the most amazing shed I think that I've seen, and especially so far as living quarters is it's a pretty common thing out in semi-rural and rural properties farming properties that often people can reside in sheds but normally they don't exist just with a dusty floor and a, a timber steel frame and the corrugated metal deck around the outside um but the the best one that i saw in my property valuation days where was I? I was going out to do evaluation. I think I was in the Midwest. So is it Nabawar or a bit further out than that? And uh, it was like a semi-rural property. And I went out there to do evaluation of what I thought was a house. And when I got out there, all I could see was a shed on the property, but there were a couple of cars parked out the front. So I thought, I oh, there looks like there'll be people around there. And when I walked inside this shed, if not for me seeing the fact that it was a shed on the outside, I would have thought... I was in a house. This thing was yep. decked out with walls and ceilings and lighting and air conditioners. And I, if yeah, if I had just woken up in this place, um, I would have thought that I was actually in a um, in just a normal house. And then I'd step outside of the house and go, "Oh my God, that thing's a shed." So I can't remember exactly how it worked so far as natural light is concerned, but it was the best decked out house shed I've ever seen ever. Oh, that's what I said. I mean, you just think about a garden shed, but the things with regard to a shed has got me in. So I'm going to uh, we'll do a little uh, we'll do a little segment about the shed. We might even see if we can't get a guest associated with the shed. We'll that's see how good, we go. Mate, I'm excited for you. I know you are. <laughs> you're not really. Mm -hmm. You're not really. No. But it's a it's a topic of a difference. It's a topic with a difference. It's all about hey, property. Give us an if question. I, an if question. Okay, if you're a shed person. What would you? What sort of shed would you have, and what would you have in it? Okay, for me, um, my dream shed would be um, cars. Definitely has to involve cars. Uh, not so much a workshop because okay. I'm not really a mechanically car -y person. But what I do love doing is when my car's all clean just standing there and looking at it, um, going and sitting in it and turning up the radio. Uh, there'd be like probably a snooker table um, in the shed as well, like not a pool table but a full-size snooker table. There'd definitely be a dartboard as well. Uh, and I guess a massive television that's going to be able to have whatever whatever sport. It can be the cricket, obviously the footy when it's on, but it would be a an oversized man cave uh, with the cars included, no doubt. What about you, mate? Yep. That's, that's probably a bit boring, actually, a bit predictable. But uh, 
What what would TV have in in his shed? Well, well, I'm I like the idea. I like the idea of combining the shed, and I saw one of these and having a gazebo. So it becomes sort of like a barbecue entertainment shed. So right. you've sort of got one one part of it, and you sort of extend that to a gazebo, which is something that I have wanted to do um, with our place in Geraldton because we've got a pool there. And I wanted to extend that. And so you've got a gazebo area where you can entertain. And then you've got your shed. And your shed might be where it can become, like you're saying, a bit of a TV room. But it also might be a section there where um, it becomes my gym because I like my, my my fitness stuff. And um, uh, and then, of course, I like, I like fiddling around. Even here, you see my weekends. I just love going outside and fiddling around in the shed, be it putting something together or cleaning it up or tidying it up or... I make a mess and then I go back in two weeks' time. So that's a mess. I need to clean it up. Um, so yeah, I, I just I and I'm like you. I've got my radio already set up. It's only a little shed here in our uh, unit here, but it's just I don't know. It's just a place that, as I say, I get back to as a child when my with my grandfather and and his association with the shed. Um, and uh, I must admit, when I cleaned up my dear old dad's house recently after fifty odd years. Um, it was a big, big job cleaning out the shed and some of the things that I found in that shed. So, yeah, I, I don't know whether I'd be specific, but I wouldn't mind it combining my shed with with entertainment. That's how I would see it. And a gazebo um, extension as part of that shed, I reckon that would be uh, pretty cool. So Sounds that's my like thing. you got a plan, mate. You should probably that's get it. up to Gerald's and for the weekend and get it done. Oh, I don't know about that. Hey, listen, yeah. it's been a good week. Um, I've really yeah. enjoyed my Again, cross to, we, we've run out of time again with a couple of things, but we'll certainly get on next week regarding rental property and selling and a couple of other things we wouldn't mind covering. But, um, mate, been an absolute pleasure. And to all our listeners or, or followers, um, you can always send us a question. And uh, if you've got some ideas about some topics, topics or you've got some photos, you might like to post those photos on, on, um, on our social media page of your shed. shed. Oh, that'd be great. Mate, I'm going to go and get one. I'm going to go and turn on the light out the back and go and take a photograph of my shed right now. <laughs> I might do the same. All right, mate, take care. Have a great week, and I'll uh, look forward to catching up with you. I'm going to catch up with you tomorrow, actually. Yeah, 1 o'clock. We'll see you there. Yep. See you then. We'll see take you care. The shed. People have been watching uh, or watch later on, um, please take care. Please, uh, some of these things are really important. If you're buying or if you're selling, um, be conscious of your special conditions and uh, have a great week and hope you're successful. Take care. Bye.